All right, good morning. I wasn't sure if I had muted or not, so we can tell it's not muted. Good morning. And it's good to see you guys here. We love going through scripture, so that's what we're going to do right now. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark. And what we do in the middle of the service is we like to preach and teach through books of the Bible. And you'll hear us say this often, that we do this because we believe the Bible is God's word given to us to better know and understand the person and work of Jesus. It's not a book that just tells us a list of rules of things that we have to do to be made right with God, but it gives us a grand story of who this amazing God is and how much he loves us, that he would bring rebels and outcasts into his kingdom, not because of our good work, but because of his good work for us in doing that, just revealing his graciousness, his mercy, his amazing character. So that's what the scriptures are about. So if the scriptures really do tell us about this amazing God who loves us so much, then we're actually going to want to know what they say and what they tell us that life should be lived like if this is the creator who's made us, and he is so good. So that's why we open the Bible week after week, why we teach through it, to see what does it have to say for us, reminding us of who Jesus is, and now how do we respond to this. So if you would turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, if you have a paper Bible, you'll see there it's kind of near the back of the Bible. It's one of the longer books of the New Testament, so it should be pretty easy to find. If you're using an app, that's okay too. I'm going to get you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to be focusing in on verse 31 to the end of the chapter, but also starting chapter 11, just the first verse in chapter 11 though, so it's not like we're taking a huge chunk. It's actually a small chunk compared to usual, but don't worry, I'll fill the time because I like to do that. So while you're turning there, before we actually read the scripture or have it read on the screen behind, let's, let's set our hearts right to hear from God's word through some prayer. Father, thank you so much that you've given us your word that we can rejoice in the scriptures, we can be reminded of the amazing good news given to us in how you've loved us so much that you sent your only son, that whoever believes in him should not have life apart from you, but should have eternal life. Thank you for this amazing good gift. Please open our eyes this morning to what you want us to see in the scripture. Open our ears to what you want us to hear from your word. I pray that my words would get out of the way and your words would be made clear. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's listen as the scriptures read on the screen behind me. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 to chapter 11, verse 1. So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. So, like I said, it's a short one, but once again, we have a section that starts with the word so. It's the same kind of thing as the word for or therefore. It's revealing something about what he was just talking about. What is happening here is he's actually summing up all of chapters 8 to 10 in this final section that we're going through today. And he's reminding this church in Corinth that the freedom and the liber liberty that they now have because of Jesus is not just for themselves. It's ultimately given to them for the mission of God, to make much of God, to show the world who this amazing God is. So Paul used the examples of loving weaker brothers and sisters, using examples of avoiding idolatry. And he was also, even just last week, and the weeks before, getting us to ponder, what do we do when a non-Christian invites us over for a meal? Like, practical questions like that, he's getting us to think through. And now last week, Mark did a great job of reminding us and pointing out how when we approach things, we need to approach things through the lens of not what is going to allow me to express the most freedom for myself, but what is going to best communicate what I believe about Jesus and the gospel. This is what Paul's trying to get us to think through. And so Paul starts off with the phrase in verse 31, whether you eat or drink. So he's taking us back to the previous lessons he's been trying to teach in verse, or chapter 10 here, where he talked about food being sacrificed to idols. But he's also bringing the idea that we, we can't drink of the table of the Lord and the table of demons at the same time. If you remember back to verse 21 of chapter 10. But then, so he's, he's summing up what he's just been saying, but then he also says, or whatever you do, so now he's saying that what we had here in specifics can be applied to all of life. So there's something that encompasses 
the entirety of the Christian life. And that's something, he says, is that we are to do all to the glory of God. So this is everything that Paul's been pointing us to. Everything that he's been talking about has been leading to this phrase. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is where it's all been pointing. Now the Puritans, they thought this was so important that in the year 1648, they made this idea, the very first question and answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. This is what it says. What is the chief end of man? Meaning, why is man put here on the earth? It says, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Essentially repeating what Paul's saying, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God, right? So if we're supposed to do everything, which is what Paul means when he says, whatever you do to the glory of God, then we should probably know what that means. What does it mean to do something to the glory of God? Now, the word glory, it's the Greek word doxa, and it combines a bunch of different things together. It's the ideas of belief, belief, truth, beauty, brightness, praise, and worship. All these together kind of make up the word glory and what that means. So when we are glorifying God, we're doing something to the glory of, or when we're doing something to the glory of God, it, it means that our actions are we are acting in such a way as to reveal the truth of God through the worship of him. Does that make sense? I'll I'll say that again. In our actions, we're acting in such a way as to reveal the truth of God through the worship of him. So in other words, we show people what God is like through our thoughts, actions, and deeds, and in our motives. And all those things, when we do that, we're glorifying him. And that's, As Christians, we do this because this is how we're designed. We're designed to glorify God. We're designed to make much of him. We were created in God's image, and part of that means that we reflect to others around us, and even to ourselves, of who God is, what he's like. So we're really supposed to be like mirrors or giant reflectors. Has anybody ever done like a photography class or taken photos, and you see these big white discs that you can put like gold on the other side or silver on the other side? You hold them up and it's to reflect the light. You move them in different places and it shines the light in different areas. That's kind of what we're supposed to be like. We're to reflect the glory of God to others so that they see who he is. But the problem is that even though that's what we're made for, we're broken. We're not in the, in the state that we were supposed to be. And that means we don't properly reflect God's glory all the time. Often we're, at, we're trying to reflect our own glory. We're trying to get others to think that we're so great. We want to take glory for ourselves. We want to make much of ourselves, and we want others to make much of us. Now, this is both an individual problem, but then as individuals who do this collectively, it's, it's a collective global problem as well. And because of all that, humanity is broken. And because we're not seeing the proper reflection of the glory of God around us, we end up worshiping things other than God because we fail to see God's beauty and his glory as we should, because we're not reflecting it as as his image bearers. So then we end up glorifying and worshiping all sorts of other things. Even the good things that God has made and that God has given us, we worship those things. And this is exactly why Paul warned us over and over again to flee idolatry. Escape it, get rid of it. Just don't be involved with idolatry. But the beauty that we see here in verse 31 is that Paul's laying out what it can actually look like practically for us to live out the Christian life. And so he says, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, Paul says, you have an opportunity to glorify God. So whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, you can make much of God. You can worship Jesus. You can demonstrate that the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart and life. No matter what you're doing. So that means whether you're at home folding the laundry, you can glorify God. When you're reading stories to your kids, you can glorify God. When you're shopping at the co-op, you're driving your kids to soccer practice, maybe you're paying your bills online, you can glorify God in all those things. Now, the everyday stuff that you do in your life, it's not unimportant to God. Some people might think, well, is this really that important to God? I mean, think about how he's made us to participate in seemingly menial tasks day in and day out. And God has designed your life to be filled with all these moments of normalcy, things that you, you probably find quite uninteresting. But God has put them there every moment of every day 
for you to glorify him, for you to worship him, to make much of him, and to enjoy him. That means it's not just when you show up on a Sunday, maybe two or three times a month, that you get to glorify God with the church as you gather. It's not just when you're reading your Bible or singing Christian songs that you can glorify God. And it's also not just those who become pastors or overseas missionaries that get to glorify God. If you've been given a new heart by the Holy Spirit and God lives in you and you believe that Jesus died in your place for your sin, that he rose again, bringing newness of life where you are now, be, you've been brought into his kingdom by his goodness and his work and he's given you eternal life. That means you get to glorify God. It's not just the other special people out there. You get to glorify God in everything you do. And it's not even just in the easy moments, the normal moments, the, the, the times when everything's going great. Yay, yay God, you're awesome. But you can also glorify God when times are hard. In the most difficult moments in your life where everything is going wrong. You can glorify God when you're waiting to hear the news of a potential miscarriage. You can glorify God while you're in the hospital. You can glorify God while you're waiting to receive a life-altering surgery. Even in the darkest moments of your life, the moments you experience, the trials, the temptations that Paul was just talking about earlier in chapter 10, in all those things, you've been given an opportunity to glorify God. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, well, that, that's great that I can glorify God. Uh, okay, I, I'm excited that it's not just for special people. And if we're saved by Jesus, we can do this with anything and everything. But you might be wondering, well, well how do we do this? How do we glorify God? Well, it's, it's a good thing that the catechism that we've been going through, the New City Catechism, it, it asks the exact same question. And if you remember all the way back when we did question number six, which was in February, and if you don't remember, I'm, I'm right there with you because I don't remember things half the time either. But this is the question we had, and it answered it. And it said, how can we glorify God? And this is the answer it gives. We glorify God by enjoying him, loving him, trusting him, and obeying his will, commands, and law. So uh, author Brian Chappell, he, he puts it this way. We do as Jesus said, and we believe what he said. So in order to glorify God, we actually need to know God. We need to understand who he is. We need to know his character. We need to know Jesus. Because Jesus pointed us to God. He is God in the flesh. So if we want to know God, we know Jesus. And the way we most clearly know and understand Jesus is by picking up our Bible. It's by reading the scriptures. It's understanding who God is because that's where he's most clearly revealed to us. This is exactly why we preach and teach through books of the Bible. We want you to know the Bible. And this is why we encourage you to read the Bible yourself. It's not just enough to come and hear us teach it, but we want you to be immersed in the Scriptures, get to know this amazing God who's revealed himself through the Scriptures. Read the New Testament, read the Old Testament, and understand God's character through the unfolding story of redemption. God's given us his word so that we might know him and love him. So let the scriptures be so ingrained in your minds that you just can't help but meditate on them. Like think deeply on what the scriptures say. And as you get to know him, as you begin to understand his character, you're going to find that his commands are not actually burdensome and they actually lead to flourishing and they don't steal your joy. In fact, it's through truly understanding and seeing the love that Jesus has for you that you begin to experience a deep, and lasting joy that can actually last through, through those most painful experiences of your life. And then in those areas, this is where you can glorify God. And as we enjoy God, we, we actually become satisfied in him as our deepest joy and our source of joy. And John Piper, he loves to say this, that God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. So do you want to glorify God? Then get your satisfaction in God. Enjoy him. Trust him. And as you trust him, you'll want to obey his will. You'll want to obey his commands. You'll want to obey the royal law of love that he's given us to follow. So then if your new goal in life actually starts to line up with God's design, which is to glorify him, then, then as you do these things, you'll probably want to start asking yourself, am I glorifying God? Is what I'm doing glorifying God? 
Because even though Paul says, whatever you do, there are things that just don't glorify God, right? So, this can happen in both our actions as well as our motives. Because there's things that, that we do that we don't think about doing. And it might be something that could be God-glorifying, but if our motives aren't right, we're not actually glorifying God. But then there's also things that you might, have, you might think you have a good motive for it, but they're just not things that can glorify God. They're, they're things that we're just not supposed to do. So if that's the case, how do we determine what things can or can't glorify God? Well, let's start with our actions because actions are usually easier to, to discern than motives. But first, you just ask the question, does this go against any of God's commands? Now, I know we played the intro video of John Piper many times where he, asks, where he says, don't just ask, is it a sin? That's about the lowest question you can ask. You guys probably remember hearing that, right? But at the same time, that's not a bad question to ask, to start at least. Obviously, you don't want to end there, but there are things that God has clearly forbidden, both in the Old Testament, which Jesus fulfilled, but also in the New Covenant. There are things that God says, this does not line up with my character. So for example, you're not going to glorify God as you gossip or slander someone. You can't say, well, well, I was slandering them to the glory of God. That just doesn't work. You also, you're not going to glorify God if you're flirting with someone else's spouse. You're not going to glorify God if you're cheating on your taxes or, or tests. These things aren't glorifying to God because for things that the Bible clearly tells us is sin, you can't do those to the glory of God. But for things that the Bible doesn't clearly say are sin, that means that it likely fits in that realm that Paul was talking about, whatever you do. And then those things can be used for the glory of God. So then as a next step, we have to ask ourselves, which is just like what John Piper asks, does it get in my way? Or does it help me run? Does it help me run this race that God has given us? Now this one's a little harder because our motives start to get involved. And we have to start thinking a bit about how these things will impact us in the long term and how this impacts the mission that we've all been called to, to make disciples. So the answers, as you try to figure out, does this glorify God? They're not always going to be super clear cut. You're going to really need to lean on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit as you read and study the scriptures. You're going to need to lean into the wisdom of understanding the heart and the character of God. You're going to need to lean in the wisdom of talking to brothers and sisters in Christ and, and hearing how they approach things. So even the determination of whether something gets in my way or helps me run the race, it's going to be potentially different depending on the day, my life circumstances, and what kind of responsibilities I have, right? So additionally, let's read verse 31 again, but I, but I also want us to look at verse 32 and 33. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Then he goes on and says, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. So we also want to ask, is what I'm doing going to get in the way of proclaiming the gospel that others might be saved? Something might not be a sin, but if you do it, it'll offend people to the point where they're not willing to listen to the gospel. And they don't want to hear it from you. So when Paul says he, he does all these things to please everyone, he's, what he's not saying is that it's always God glorifying to be a people pleaser. That's not necessarily what he's saying. But what he is saying is that he's not going to let any other offense get in the way of someone being offended by the gospel. Because the gospel is an offense, but all these other things, we don't want that to be something that detracts from the offense of the gospel. Because when the gospel comes at you, you have to make a choice. When, you're, when it's revealed to you that you are a sinner in need of salvation, meaning you've rebelled against a holy God, at that moment, you have to figure out, what am I going to do with that? God's offering me salvation, but I have to admit that I've done bad, I've done wrong, I've gone against what God wants me to have. So to many, that's offensive because they are told as they grow up, you're perfect, you're great, you're, you have goodness inside of you, don't worry, everything you do is awesome. That offends people when you say that's actually not true. But that's the offense we want. We don't want to offend them by anything else. So let's maybe start thinking about the fact that it's not about our freedoms, it's not just about the things we get to do, but we want to think about how can all the things that I get to do help others see the beauty 
of Jesus through the gospel. But again, glorifying God is making much of him, right? It's declaring his beauty and his, his awesomeness. So let's take this for an example. Can I glorify God playing video games? Some of you might think, well, of course. And others might think, I don't see how. Well, let's, starting, let's start by thinking, is it a sin? Well, if you look through the scriptures, there's nothing in the scriptures that say anything about how games are a sin, whether they're video games or otherwise. So at that point, it's already being put in the position of probably, right? Now, if I'm supposed to be at work, if I'm avoiding responsibilities, maybe I'm spending more money on upgrades for my computer than I give to the proclamation of the gospel, or maybe I find myself constantly getting angry at the people I play with, you know, then in those instances, I'm probably not playing video games to the glory of God. Now, if the games I play make me act in such a way as that I'm really offensive to those around me because I get so angry or upset or who knows what, and if I tell them the gospel, they don't want to hear it because they're just sick of me, then I'm probably not playing games to the glory of God either. Now, if I can play a reasonable amount and I'm not detracting from my responsibilities and, and I acknowledge that Jesus is right with me as I'm playing and I'm thankful to him that I get to play, then I think in those instances, yes, you can glorify God in playing video games. You can play video games to the glory of God. Now, this whole issue of doing so with a thankful heart that I brought out, I think that's actually a, a big key. And Paul just talked about it actually in verse 30 about doing things with a thankful heart. If you have your Bible open, you can just look right at verse 30. For if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? So he's talking about receiving everything with thankfulness. And I think this, this actually helps protect us from doing things for our own glory. It also helps protect us from slipping into idolatry where we glorify the gift above the giver. See, if we're truly thankful to God for something, then it's naturally going to lead to us glorifying him through it. When we're thankful to Jesus, it reminds us that the gift we have is not the end goal. It's a blessing from God who is the giver of that gift. Now, it does not mean that the gift is not important. Because the gifts are actually very important. God has given us these good gifts for a good reason. And don't you think it would be a slap in God's face if he gave us gifts that we didn't enjoy? Like, if I heard that one of my kids really wanted a bike, and he had a specific bike that had these specific features, and I thought to myself, you know what, maybe I'll save up. And rather than get him that specific bike he wants, I know the features he wants and what he likes, and I'm actually going to get him a better bike that he would like even more. Now, if I give that to him, and when I give it to him, he says to me, you know, this is a really nice bike, but I'm afraid that if I take this from you, I'm going to like the bike more than you. I'm going to love the bike more than I love you, so I'm just going to, I'd rather you just return the bike, because I can't take this in good conscience, because that would just be, that would be too hard on our relationship. I mean, for one, none of my kids would say that, but, because that's ridiculous, but don't we sometimes do that with God's gifts too? It's like a slap in the face, right? If I give my son a bike, it's because I want him to enjoy it. I want to see him riding it and flourishing with it and learning new things with it. But if, if on the other hand, he, he comes to me and says, thank you so much for the bike. And I get to watch him ride the bike and he comes back in and says, thank you, daddy, this was so good. I can't believe you got me this bike. I'm so happy that you got this for me. Like that would bring me joy. That would be glorifying me in that instance. But for him to say, no, I can't take the bite. That, that's just too much. I don't deserve this. This is not good. That's not making much of my generosity. His false piety would be an affront to the gift and the gift giver. It's not thankful. But if he was truly thankful, it would not lead him to loving the bike more than he loved me. It would lead him to loving me all the more the same thing for us. We can glorify God in the enjoyment of the gifts he gives us. But if we actually thank him for those gifts, it's going to allow us to use the gifts that he gives us in the proper context. And it makes us way less likely to actually abuse or idolize these gifts. Now, some of you are still maybe stuck on how do we glorify God in all these different things because you're thinking about your job. And you're thinking my job just sucks. Like, it's meaningless. I don't know how we can glorify God in our work because this is a big one for us. 
especially if you're around my age, maybe probably younger, you've grown up with this mentality that we're looking for meaning in our work that hardly any previous generation has ever thought of before. I mean, most previous generations were very happy to have a job. You could clock into at 8 a.m., be done at 5 p.m. You had enough food to feed your family, and that's all that they needed. But now more and more people are thinking that it's, there's no meaning in a job unless it's going to directly solve some big crisis that's currently plaguing the world. It's not enough just to be the mail clerk in a place that helps make the world a better place either. If you're not in the front lines, if you're not the CEO or the director, provided you're also given a nice big salary, then it seems like we act like our work is meaningless. But what Paul says here, that you can glorify God in whatever you do, it actually goes directly against that, right? That means that you can have a job in nearly any field, in any position, assuming it's not in an industry that's directly promoting or profiting off of sin, you can glorify God in that job. You don't need to become a pastor. You don't have to start a nonprofit. You don't have to feed the homeless with your job. You don't have to be the head of an orphanage to glorify God. You can also be a janitor, a fence builder, a contractor. You can be an occupational therapist, a building estimator, a realtor, a doctor, a grocery clerk, a stay-at-home mom, a mail carrier, an electrician, a fast food worker, a filmmaker, a web developer, a teacher. And you know what? You could even be a lawyer to the glory of God. You can do all these things to the glory of God. If you show up to work, you thank Jesus for the job that you have, and you devote yourself to doing the best job that God has enabled you to do because you are a child of God, because you've been saved by Jesus, because you know that your work reflects the God who made you, if you do that, as you work, you're glorifying God. And on those days where you don't like your job, which, who knows, it might be most of them. Maybe you have bad coworkers who just, you have a hard time getting along with. Maybe work is just really hard, and the curse that Adam had in the garden that said that you're going to do your work by the sweat of your brow, you go, I identify with that. You know what? As you pray and you ask God to reveal the opportunities that he's giving you to glorify him, you might actually find that your job is a little less irritating every day. And you, as you attempt by your best efforts that the Holy Spirit enables you to have to glorify him in your work, you might start to find that you can enjoy God as you do your work, which you might think is meaningless. But because you might still think your work is meaningless, I want you to take a step back and think about how God made the world. God made the entire world to point out who he is. As Paul writes to the Romans, he says that the whole creation points to God's invisible attributes, all of it. So the fact that we get to enjoy beauty and order and design, all of those things, they're testament to who God is and how he made the world. And when you look at the way, all the ways, the, the good ways that God has designed the world to work, Think of the fact that we have systems in place that allow us to have food on our plates that we didn't actually have to farm. Think about the fact that, at least here in Canada, you can walk into a medical facility and receive treatment to a variety of illnesses and diseases like almost right away. All of these things have come about because there's a bunch of people in the world doing small things that individually reflect the different attributes of God and his creative design. And in the end, they point us to the glory and the goodness of God. All these little things, they come together to point us to who God is. So maybe you think, oh, I'm just someone who stocks shelves at the grocery store. How is that glorifying to God? Well, you're part of a, a greater system that God has enabled to be in the world where you're actually helping feed the doctors who are actually out there helping their patients recover from serious injury using the gifts that God has given them. And maybe you're someone who stocks shelves at a sporting goods or a barbecue accessory shop. Or maybe you own or you sell these things. Remember, you can glorify God in recognizing that you are actually better helping people enjoy the food that God has given them. And you're helping people find ways to, to rest and to recover from, from hectic schedules so they don't have to feel or so that they can be able to recognize that they're not the center of the world that the world can actually run when they're, they're not doing everything. Again, 
as long as you're not in, in an industry that is directly involved in sin, then your job, no, no matter how menial you think it is, it's part of something bigger that God can be using to make the world a better place, to remind us of his goodness. And all of this is to the glory of God. Remember, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, if you're eating a sandwich, if you're drinking a nice pint of British ale, if you're working your job digging dishes, scrubbing floor mats, painting fences, signing documents, do it all to the glory of God. And as we seek to do that, I want us to look at what Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 11. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So Paul says to the Corinthians and really everyone who's reading this letter, including us, to imitate him as he imitates Jesus. This is what he wants for us. Paul's so confident in the fact that he has been given the ability to glorify God in all that he does that he asks us to follow him and imitate him. Now, how many of us would be bold enough to call others to do the same? If others actually followed your example, would you think that they're glorifying God? What if everyone in the church participated like you, showed up as much as you, gave as much as you? What if everyone in the church worked like you, sacrificed like you, repented like you? How uncomfortable does that make you feel? Or do you think, that's a church I'd like to be involved with? See, in a sense... As your pastors and elders, Mark and I, on a weekly basis, we're hoping that we're calling you to imitate us as we imitate Jesus. We want you to follow and imitate us as we imitate Jesus. But in saying that, we know that we're sinners. We know that we need to be reminded of the fact that we don't glorify God all the time either. In fact, most of the time we probably don't. We seek our own glory ahead of God's. We worship things other than Jesus. We get sidetracked, just like you guys. Cars and vacations, hobbies and toys. But the beauty is that we get to point to the one who has always glorified God in everything he did. He did it perfectly. None of us glorify God all the time. I mean, we're supposed to, we should. The Holy Spirit's given us the ability to. But Jesus did. And that's the beauty. We point to the one who glorified God in all he did. Jesus lived a life that was full of the glory of God. And again, for those of you who think you have meaningless jobs, remember, Jesus worked as a carpenter for his first 30-some years of life. And he did it to the glory of God. He wasn't a CEO. He wasn't a tech startup. He wasn't a CEO. I said that already, but he still wasn't. He wasn't a prolific writer. But in every moment in his job, while awake or asleep, every moment of every day, Jesus did everything for the glory of God. And what did we do to him for it? Did we congratulate him? Did we give him the throne that he deserves? No. People just like us, they yelled out, crucify him. And then they nailed him to a cross. This is what it gets you sometimes when you pour your whole life into glorifying God. You're not going to get the accolades you think you might deserve when you do it all for the glory of God. But there's a beauty in that as well because even in death, even in his suffering, even as Jesus was being persecuted, he did it all to the glory of God. He did it to make much of God and God's grace for us. Because as he died, he was doing it in our place for our sin. And as he did that, he showed the world that death could not hold God either. And as he died to the glory of God, he rose to the glory of God. Newness of life given to the one who rules over all. And now he tells us that all who follow after him who imitate Jesus, as we die, we too will rise one day and follow into eternal life with him to the glory of God. 
So for all of us who believe and trust in Jesus, he actually sends his Holy Spirit. He dwells inside us so that we can stop trusting ourselves, so we can repent, we can turn back to Jesus, and we can do all that we do, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we can do it all for the glory of God. So Father, I'm just praying that you would remind us day in and day out that everything that we have been given to us, we can do this for your glory. Thank you that even, even in these things that we think are normal and meaningless, you've given us meaning because it's for your glory. Thank you for the beauty of who you are, Jesus, that you allow us to seek after you, to seek your will, and to be filled with joy in our satisfaction of you. Help us to be satisfied in you so that we can give you glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.